Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Elizabeth Sackler. I am proud chair of the board of the Brooklyn Museum and also have had the pleasure of opening the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art in 2007. It's been wonderful working with the Brooklyn Museum. It's been wonderful working with Catherine, our, uh, Catherine Morris, who is our curator of the Sackler Center. And it's been wonderful having programs such as these uh, regularly and with audiences as enthusiastic as I think you will be this evening. And tonight is very special. It's marking the fifth anniversary of the Helene Zucker Seaman Memorial Exhibition Fund. And it will be with a conversation, as you probably know, with Arlene Sheckett and Catherine Morris, who is the Sackler family curator. And um, Catherine is very modest, but she is a wonderful, wonderful interviewer. So I uh, suspect that uh, we are in for a treat. And Arlene, it will be very interesting and fun for you, I think, to be in conversation with Catherine. Helene zucker seaman was a curator, an archivist, an artist, an art historian, an author, a mentor, a wife, a mother, and a friend. This list describes the very roles she played, but only hints at who she was, what she achieved, and how deeply she affected the many people whose lives she touched before hers ended so tragically in June of 2010. And I'd like to recognize Marilyn Greenberg. Marilyn, would you please stand up? She is the current chair. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Marilyn. She is the current chair of the uh, Council for Feminist Art, and she is a member of the Brooklyn Museum Advisory Board. But mainly, Marilyn is the person who came to me and said that she felt having a memorial exhibition fund in her very good friend's name would be an honor to Helene, and that it would be something that would be remembered always and forevermore. And it is a beautiful uh, fund. We, you do accomplish a lot. It supports women artists. It, it promotes the connection of people to art and to each other through the exhibition of art, which I'm understanding was so very important to Helene. The endowment fund was launched in 2011. I don't know how many of you were there uh, at our reception. It raised in the first year, the fund raised $50,000, and it's now over $100,000, and over 100, almost 120 people have contributed to it. And so um, the fund has supported thus far, uh, in part, uh, Eva Hesse Spectres, which was uh, 2011, all the Sackler Center, materializing six years, Lucy Lepard in the emergence of conceptual art, and that was in 2012. In 2013, Wengechi Mutu, A Fantastic Journey. In 2014, Judith Scott, and it will be also a contributing supporter to our exhibition opening on December 10th, Agitprop. And I hope that you will all be here for the opening of that. And I thank the fund very much for its participation in all these wonderful shows. I would like to uh, say a thank you to the Helene Zucker Seaman Memorial Fund Committee. And I'm going to ask you to please stand, because today is a celebration of the fifth anniversary. And without all of your work, it would not have happened. Reva Blumenfeld, please stand. Maggie Colin, Claudia DeMonte, Judy Fryer, Jane Goldblum, Marilyn Greenberg again, Nana Groskein, Gracie Manchin, are you here? And Rothstein and Jane Searis. And thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Helene's family is here. I would like you also, please, to stand. Her beloved Fred Seaman, please. I just saw you earlier. Ford and Lindsay Seaman, her son and daughter-in-law. Her son, Curtis, are you here? Yes, wonderful. Herbert and Cynthia Zucker, Helene's brother and sister-in-law, are here. And sister Michelle Cantor. 
and last but first, Helene's mother, Marsha Zucker. Thank you to the family, thank you to the fund, and thank you all for being here this evening. When you checked in, you received information about how to become a partner in the fund, and I hope you will join all of us by contributing to it. And tonight's special program, uh, as I said earlier, we are in for a treat, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Catherine Morris, who is a Sackler family curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. She is a good friend, a great scholar, and a fabulous curator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little embarrassed. Um, but I'm not embarrassed to introduce Arlene, which is the point of being here tonight. It's a thrill to be able to have this conversation and to have Arlene here and to have everybody from Arlene's family and the fund and supporters here um, this evening to celebrate with us five years of great work and um, looking forward to lots of future projects as well. Arlene. Eileen Sheckett lives and works in New York City and upstate New York. Um, a critically acclaimed 20-year survey of her work, All at Once, which the New York Times called some of the most imaginative American sculpture of the past 20 years and some of the most radically personal, was on view of the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston from June to September of this year. It just closed. In addition to the exhibition catalog, Greg Miller has published a book that focuses on Eileen's porcelain work at the Mycenae Factory in Berlin. Um, both of these books are available in our bookstore if you'd like to acquire them. Um, Arlene's work is included in many distinguished public and private collections, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Walker Art Center, the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and she has upcoming exhibitions at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, the Phillips Collection in Washington, and the Jewish Museum here in New York. Um, she's represented by Sickerman Jenkins and Company in New York City, and was featured in the latest season of Art 21 on PBS. So that's the biographical outline, but we are all thrilled now to have the actual person. So thank you, Arlene. And we will have a conversation after um, we have Arlene speak for 20 minutes or so. Thank you. to be here. Thank you all for coming out. I'm glad the whole art world is not a freeze. Um, and um, because we're having a multi-part evening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly go through about 20 minutes of my work, mostly centered on the ceramics, um, and but it's going to be contextualized within the exhibition at the ICA, so there'll be flashes of seeing that show. Um, and uh, we will begin, um, let's see, maybe should we begin by lowering the lights a little? Oh, that's so much better, thank you. So, um, so we're, we're starting, I just want to do um, show this piece from about 22 years ago, which was in this recent show, because this work um, in plaster and paint was, this body of work um, is where the show started and the whole notion of Eastern thought and, and Western sculpture um, combined very dynamically in the things that I'm making now. They're, they still are very present. Um, and right before I started making the clay work, I did some glass pieces. And the thing that uh, about the glass, um, aside from just that the glass is molten in beauty, uh, is that all I kept on thinking about was how it, um, glass blowing was just about enclosing breath, that, that it was about that idea of hollowness. Um, I didn't want to continue to work um, within a team. I wanted to work 
more um, in a solitary fashion as a as a studio artist, and so um, Clay became um, part of what part of the answer for that. Um, because the thing about working in clay was that it requires hollowness. So it very, very similar in many different ways to working in glass. Um, in fact, many materials are similar. But these are um, some of the first clay things that I did um, and started out um, being shown in this exhibition at the ICA. These were, this was in the first room of ceramic uh, works. And so these are from about 2006, 2007. Uh, so in a certain way, these are, I think of them like breathing machines and um, lungs. And uh, that was where I started with the whole idea of enclosed air. Um, this is a view of the um, one part of the exhibition, the long gallery um, that had the ceramic works, um, beginning with things that had little color but had a lot of shine and flash and gold and silver, and then um, later on adopting color, uh, and I'll show some of that. Um, just to get inside of the other, of, of, for those of you who are less familiar with how one builds in clay and to really describe what I mean by something being hollow, I have some process shots from the studio where um, you can see some of the silly props that I have to use to make these things stand up um, and not fall down. And then the inside, and that, that I wanted it, um, to work with this hollowness, and then the strange thing was the insides of the pieces actually started to look like lungs. Um, here's the outside of piece again, 2007, lol. Uh, so these extensions and sense of um, both balance, sturdiness, and imbalance, and kind of precariousness was what I was and still, still am seeking in the work. Um, and I am not going to show, I'm only showing this one piece as a reference, but this Mayo um, woman, you know, falling, um, but falling but not falling, that is, you know, has always been a kind of touchstone piece for me, and um, there's so many things about this that I love. <clears throat> there's, um, this is in front of the Louvre, but there is one in the garden at the uh, Museum of Modern Art that is almost dunking into the water. But this, this um, use of, of that kind of psychological, physical, philosophical tension that is happening with those pieces, with that piece, and then also the kind of stability within imbalance. Um, so here, um, my own uh, really didn't dictate what the stand was, what the what how this these pieces were going to be um, displayed, but looking at that work, and I, of course, I wasn't conscious when I was making this, but that, that use of the pedestal, this is another thing that has come up around my work, so I'm going to just touch on some of the things that people have mentioned about the work, and then I'm ha very, very happy to take questions afterwards. So this layering of materials and form. <clears throat> Working um, in ceramics involves taking something, making it, drying it, and then putting it in a machine, sort of a large toaster oven, uh, kiln, the, and, and heating it to 2,000 degrees. Um, and all bets are sort of off, but this is a piece um, as it's about to come out, but 
The re one of the reasons I'm showing this is so you can see what the inside of the kiln looks like and you can see that the material that um, the kiln is constructed from is fire brick. Uh, and these bricks uh, migrated from the kiln to become part of my work, part of the finished pieces over time. And so this piece um, that you're looking at um, is a uh, sleepless color and the ceramic part of the work is, is unglazed but the bricks are glazed so I began to invert the whole relationship of what is outside um, and what is inside and what is glazed and what is not glazed and in fact how to use glaze which um, having come from doing a lot of work as a painter or being a painter, I had a big appreciation and desire to use a material that had color, surface, possibilities as integral to the material. And ceramics uh, is one of those materials because applied color again gets fired in and becomes actually part of the structure of the finished piece. Because of the wind, I'm trying to remember the names. Tattletale. And so here then the the bricks are completely built within the piece, within the sculpture. So they're migrating again from, um, from the kiln to the studio to get painted and then inset into the coils of the piece. And here's several different views, this idea of the works having many multiple views and looking different in, um, from various points of view is another just huge theme in, in, in what I'm doing, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, um, but first I'm going to mention glaze. Glazing is uh, the fabulous thing that ceramics can do, um, but also the very painful uh, thing that can, can happen. Um, and one of the weird things is that when uh, glaze is applied, at least the homemade glazes that I use, are they're mostly um, in this gray powder form. And then this is the same piece once it's fired. So while, while you're putting the stuff on, you're actually not seeing what you're doing, um, which is both thrilling and frightening and clearly I like being on that edge. Uh, but it does require crazy amounts of technical um, time with glaze testing. And this is a, a little part of my glaze laboratory at my studio upstate where I have these cones of glaze tests. Um, and so it's, it's strictly the scientific method. Let's try this, let's label it, let's put it in a book. It's, you know, it's laborious and boring, but does yield results. Um, another glazed surface um, of, with lots of different ways to think about glaze, um, best behavior, that's the name of this piece. Uh, lots of ways to think about about how to have a sculpture that is also a painting. <clears throat> idle, idle in the front and out and out in the back. Uh, so there's um, out and out again. And you can see there's a layer of kiln brick there. There is you know, it's a, it's a, some people have called this a um, riff on the kiss, or on Cousy's the kiss. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but I'll go, for, you know, any, anything, uh, anything is okay um, 
as long as it has wonderful art historical associations like that, but I also really appreciate making work that has multiple as associations. And so one of the things that I am constantly aiming for is having things that ride, um, ride the rail between being representational and recognizable and unrecognizable and non-representational, but in some, but then becoming knowable because it, you can put all that together and know something without being able to identify it. So in terms of, I'm going to show a few images of maybe just walking around a piece and it's almost an old fashioned sculptural conceit of mine that I require, um, I, may, I require that the works have um, an evolving story as, as, as the viewer walks around, or for me as the maker that I walk around. I make all of the works um, in the studio on, on a turntable. Um, so just think, you know, wrote down a studio, like just age old uh, method of working so that I'm always walking around the pieces or, and seeing that and work at six or seven sculptures at the same time and seeing them from various points of view and I require of my work that it continue to give back from all angles, from all views. And then viewed as um, up close that it has another layer of uh, visual interest, meaning, um, and and maybe puts another emotional uh, piece of information over the whole thing. So this this is an image from the last room, meaning the later the latest works. Um, the last room of the show. And, and um, this work is called no, Now Playing. Uh, and here again, just to make it incredibly explicit, um, what happens with this work and how it can be both centered and uncentered and standing upright and uh, tilting over. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the purpose of that slide and this one as well. But a whole other way of, of uh, working. I try, I work in a family of forms, but I, I try to have each one um, be its own separate experience, which is um, what happens when you work on something for six months to a year. It just, you know, it develops its own language and that, uh, that it's, it's like, you know, they become personages in my life uh, and in my studio and I listen to them and speak to them and, uh, but more importantly, they speak to me, they tell me what to ha what, what's gotta happen. Cause, uh, so that's, that's that section of the slideshow. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the show um, and a view of the ICA Boston, which is spectacular building, Diller and Scafidio building, cantilevering out over the Boston Harbor. And this is the model I worked on. I worked just in this tiny little model form um, for, you know, almost two years and trying to figure it out because when, when um, I was asked to do the show, I was just given the open space. So the, no rooms were defined. So defining how, you know what, how the story would be told, and and what would uh, what would be shown was the conversation that I had continually with with Janelle Porter, who was the curator. 
Um, so this is the opening room. And this room, um, I wanted to do it, uh, it was sort of a little bit frightening thinking about doing a show where 20 years, uh, work from 20 years ago is going to just show up uh, and I, you know, would need to own it and feel good about it and what would it look like and uh, after I got over those anxieties I realized that what I really wanted to do was do a whole other in installation with that work so that the thing wouldn't just be about the past, that it would be about the present and the future. So the installation is, uh, I had show, that's why I showed that second image in the beginning of the slideshow of, of all those um, plaster figures lined up. This became the installation um, at, at the ICA. And so I'm, it also created a language of walking around so that the idea of the works telling a story by, um, by creating movement in the viewer uh, it was set, the sta that stage was set, that story was, was told right off the bat in the first room because in order to see these works, one had to walk around. So these were um, involved paper works and those blue and white structures that you see, those vase forms, um, which made me, made me look sort of prescient in, with the later work, but you know, it wasn't really until years later that I even understood that I had done those and that they were resonating with what I um, was doing now. Um, so anyway, those, those blue and white paper vessels uh, or cast paper, not porcelain. The, the second room, walking into the second gallery, this um, installation called Building from around 2003, four, um, based on walking across the Brooklyn Bridge towards Manhattan every day and creating a um, a, a cycle that I made as a healing cycle after 9-11. Um, and uh, so it's a cycle of, of the works going from black to white and it's sort of done with a printmaking process using mold, which I won't go, go into now, but um, that was within the second room. Um, and along with some of these glass pieces, which are <clears throat> glass parts just stacked one on top of one another, it's called the balance series. Um, so nothing is joined, but um, another version of speaking about fragility and stability. Um, that was the mission in these pieces and led, were the works that I did right before I started to do ceramics. Uh, a series of paper works that I have, um, for, for almost 20 years, I've been working at Dudenay Paper Mill, working with paper as liquid. Um, so instead of um, color on the material, the color is in the material. And um, I think it's possible or very easy to see how the glaze, the idea of glaze, um, really overlaps with this notion um, very well. <clears throat> and the final part of what I'll show is um, a, a, an installation from my work at the Meissen Porcelain Factory, um, where I worked 2012 to 2013, going back and forth. And in this installation, um, the whole room the, has meaning in terms of shape and, and forms that came up, but also I worked in conjunction with the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and the Harvard Museums um, to use some historic material within my, um, my in, mixed in with my own work. This is one of my pieces, but clearly, um, 
I'm using both this historical language and contemporary language. Here you see that overlap again. Taking the idea of the base and using a stack of plates uh, for the pedestal. Revisiting um, my sin, 18th century idea of the Buddha. One of my works, Dancing Girl with Two Left Feet. Swim. And then this final image. Thank you.
really that that instead of planning it, I would be finding it. I would be in there working with an immediate experience, and so that's why I was working with plaster. I came up working with plaster and paint skins, and um, the plaster is an amazing timekeeper as a material because it goes from powder to liquid to mush to something hard as a rock within moments. So you can literally see time passing. Um, and so that, that idea and that way of working um, suited very much what I was trying to do and how I would be. And um, I, I think I have maintained that, that insistence on on, on being very present and paying attention in the studio to actually what is and what is happening and um, and not get involved too much in future processes but have you know have within my grasp things that I could actually manage um, so I'm pretty sure that's what we were talking about, we were talking about. Um, I, I, it also was in the context I, I remember of being in New York where people are always talking about not having enough time. And that idea of listening, the, you know, the thing of listening to people talk about not having enough time was really rubbing me the wrong way at that particular moment when it felt that, you know, people's lives, you know, could be, you know, uh, come to a quick end or that my, you know, time in the studio could be very limited. So I actually also made work that embraced the idea of uh, if I had a lot, a lot of time in the studio, I'd make a large plaster piece. If I had a small amount of time, I would make a small plaster piece. But I, it came, it went from beginning to end in that time. So each piece became a measure of that that day in the studio. And the improvisational nature of that, you described the improvisational relationship you feel like you have to that material. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think improvisation uh, also required the, the not having an armature. Right. And armatures, the skeletal structure that sculptors can often rely on, or that is the thing, you know, in beginning sculpture you're taught right off the bat, how to hold something up, what is the structure of things that not having an armature. So I actually worked with plaster, not with, with no armature at all. So it was really sort of this mushy mess, um, but I worked to find the form. Um, so working to discover something, working in that, with that improvisational um, vocabulary that was necessary. And the precarity that you see in so many of the pieces mm -hmm. that you described, that sort of lean or that um, instability, that apparent instability is reflective of that conversation and the idea of time. Right, right. Um, another quote. Nine years ago when I started, craft seemed so marginalized. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting choice to make non-representational sculpture out of clay. And what, I was, what we talked about, which was interesting, was this idea of craft material as being marginalized and how that felt then. And I'm wondering if you could maybe describe that a little bit and then also say how it feels now, all these years later, when it's a very, and it seems to be in a very different place in the art world. Yeah, I, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, I'm not a thousand percent sure that it's a very different place in the art world. We'll see uh, how that washes but out. But, it, it, but there, there's a possibility. Okay, so. Um, I mean, craft is a big topic, and um, a lot, a lot of I mean, I've been, I have thought about craft a lot, and um, for me, it has a lot to do with time. Also, that that if one is going to become a craftsman, it really involves a kind of practice and to make perfect. Um, and the enterprise of being an artist doesn't necessarily align with that. And my interest in using that craft material is to rub up against this idea of 
possible perfection and, and in, you know, loads of information, technical information, and not be ruled by it. Um, to, op to keep it open or to open it up and to see what's inside, inside of it because I think that you know the art world can be just an incredibly um, conservative place where there's rights and wrongs and things you know you can't do this and you can't do that and, and uh, many artists have, have uh, spoken about that but I came up against that myself. You know, I, at some point when I started to do glass, I said, oh God, I'm like a walking craft fair. Uh, but, you know, just trying to work in these materials, like there must be something, there, wherever, whenever something is marginalized, there's so much opportunity to develop a new language. And, and so much overlooked potential. And that is how I felt about uh, clay, I looked at it and I said, you know, why, why is this so on the margins when it's just this, you know, very basic thing that, um, you know, that, pe that, that, that people can work with and maybe it's, it's approachability. Like, it, it, there's, it has mystery, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe people, there, there's a, um, something about childhood embedded in it uh, that makes it less than a profession, you know, less than a serious thing. And all of that information, less than a serious thing, is very exciting to me. I like, I like that because, again, how to turn that around, how to say, yeah, this can be less than serious, but, you know, let's see if something exciting can happen. Did, did you have any problems with reception of the work as craft, since you were presenting it as obviously not within the context of craft? Um, well, I think I was, I, I, in that, in 2007 when I showed that um, body of work, uh, um, I was lucky because Roberta Smith, I think, and I didn't know this before, but uh, had a love of that material and came to the show and, you know, said it was very good. So that, you know, got me over that hump. But I have to say that there are still lots of humps <laughs> because it's still a, it's still a, a, a weird language where people worry about it. For, for instance, oh, it's fragile. Like that whole th that whole line of thinking, when people are making things out of uh, face powder and lipstick and you know dust and I, I don't understand that. So what and 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 you can walk over to a painting and put your hand on it and ruin it. So what are we talking about? What are we requiring of this of these things that you know? Made people keep continue to talk about it like that, and I, so I, I do think there is there is still a desire to have a bias, you know, against it. And the schools, uh, art schools, are complicit in that uh, because art schools are still broken down into departments that don't necessarily reflect the way art is made. And I understand it being an organization um, and having organizational issues with how departments are run, but that kind of organizational um, question, it, you know, creates meaning. It, it creates meaning um, in the same way that departments and museums create meaning by how, you know, how things are presented. So people now are way more sensitive to it, but, you know, it's going to take a while for, for it to break down. Well, that's also interesting in relationship to the process you were talking about, the way the material changes and that attraction to you and the making of it. Yeah. In a museum, clay, ceramics, porcelain is 
interesting because it's fragile, it can break if you drop it, but on the other hand, it's the thing. You can hose it down. You can hose it down, you can leave it out for a long time. It's not the first thing the conservators yeah. say, it has to go back into storage and rest for six months. You can put it in the bright light. You can put it in the bright light for a long time. It is the Forever. thing that usually one finds of older cultures that it somehow exists, even if it is broken. Yeah, it measures so the, time. So the multi, kind of, the two sides of that coin is yeah. interesting. Which is also interesting because we, there's a great interview in the um, ICA catalog that you did with um, Janine and Tony, and you talk about, in a very funny way, about the idea of slackness. Mm. And um, I think there's something <laughs> in here about that as well, and the way that, maybe I should let you describe the no, way you talk about it, but it's in relationship to, it's a little bit about abjection, and it's uh -huh. about this idea, Janine talks about performing, a dance work in which she's with a partner and they're holding a piece of string mm -hmm. and everybody's sort of interested in the tautness of the string. Mm -hmm. But what she found herself interested in was the slackness of the str string, mm -hmm. the moment in which that material is sort of loose and not formed. Mm -hmm. And she was asking you about that in relationship to this particular material, I think. Um, actually, we, uh, um, I, if, I haven't read that interview in a long time, but the I do... I think we partially got on that because of the conversation about being a woman sculptor. Yes, uh, it started with a woman sculptor and ended up about sex. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Uh, so, so, uh, so being being a I think it was a being a woman sculptor and. Um, that was one of the reasons why we were going to have the conversation because, you know, maybe there aren't so many women sculptors. Uh, um, and, uh, and sculpture has this whole heroic right. standing up straight, being right. tall Monumental. and powerful, maybe, you know, bronze, maybe on a horse. And, and so that that um, that idea of sturdiness and uprightness, which has a um, phallic subtext, uh, so so that you know that whole idea was what brought up slackness, and um, and that the she was talking about playing with uh, you know a rope that would go. Slag and I, I think, did uh, talk about whether this made it into the finished interview or not. Talk about the the um, material of clay mm -hmm. uh, as being slightly vulgar. Uh, you know that it has a it has a kind of vulgarity uh, and in its mushiness and it could be. Could be abject uh, and could be, but also can turn into something gorgeous. So, so the idea of of this mushy material then standing up, me making these structures over a long period of time, struck you know, being in this dance with the sculptures in order to make something that it verges on being almost impossible, um, and then actually making something that slumps over, mm -hmm. uh, which is much harder than making something that just stands up. So we were comparing this slackness and wanting to slump over and wanting to make that a kind, a new kind of heroic. Mm -hmm. You know, a heroic vocabulary, does heroic vocabulary only have to be about being sturdy and straight and strong, or can it be a mirror of the entire vocabulary of human experience? And so that much broader addressing of human experience as, you know, being malleable mm -hmm. and um, broad was sort of where I think that conversation was going. That's hard to follow up on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can just be over. <laughs> the, I, I love this, this, this way that you describe working. So you said that you work on sculptures, as you mentioned, you talk for six months at least. 
Oh, it's you know, just it takes a long time. A long time. Yeah. Six months sometimes. Well, because there's drying and it's, it's and sometimes I have to put them away and I keep them swaddled in plastic forever. Yeah. Then there's the glazing process and so on. I let them grow <laughs> as I watch them out of the corner of my eye mm -hmm. um, in a combined active and passive gestation. Mm -hmm. So again, it speaks to that improvisational or definitely mm -hmm. the sense of relationship that you have with them. Mm -hmm. Even when you were talking about them here in, in your talk, there's a very strong sense of an individual personality with each of the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, do you, do you continue to, to, even in the very large pieces, I'm thinking about the multi-part pieces, they have these kind of ongoing relationships, you feel like they are conversing with you and telling you mm -hmm. what to do next? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, th I feel that the art making process um, overlaps with music in a way, there's a, a call and response. Uh, vocabulary where uh, it's about making a move and then make a, a gesture within the piece and then it that has a transformational uh, quality that then speaks back to you then you have to respond again and often um, it's outside of thought it's more into knowing it so well that you don't have to know it. So it, in that way, it's like a relationship also where you're not newly examining what does this mean, you know, from the ground up, you're just having, it's not, it doesn't have a, not working on things that are easy to describe. If something, doesn't have a contradiction within it and doesn't have a, um, I'm not interested in it. You know, if it's, if it's too pure, if it's too easy to explain, if it's too one dimensional in what its meaning is, if, if, you, if it has that punchline, it's not right for me. Um, and so sometimes that happens, but that kind of, because I can't control it, you're, you're in control, but you're sort of not in, in control. You're, you're just there making moves at, with, with the thing and paying attention to what it's becoming. And, um, and then I think, I think of it, and maybe this is why it overlaps again with music as listening to it. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe obviously not on uh, on the level of hearing, but it is hearing it. It is listening. It is embracing what is happening rather than trying to muscle through it. Right. Okay, so we have you've been given the signal that we're oh. down to just a minute Where or two. Where did the signal come? So <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Um, I just want to close. I don't if you want to make a response to this, but I think okay. it's such a lovely. Um, Quote, um, one of the functions of, of art is that it disturbs the peace in the most productive way possible. I like it. You said that. I said that. Good. I believe in that. I'll go with that. And we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, do we want to ask people to come to the mic if that's possible? or? There's, I think there are two mics, one on either side. Or we could pass. I enjoyed hearing uh, this presentation, but I was also interested in your relationship to the Meissen factory. Mm -hmm. Partly how you could work with, it's a rather perfect uh, material in a way. So how did you develop a relationship to it and how did you work within the factory context? Yeah, um, that was a, a special situation because I wasn't so much, I was in the factory but they gave me my own studio that was separate within I, within the buildings, and let me just say, it was hundreds of thousands of square feet of buildings, so it, just an enormous 
uh, factory, and I think that their initial idea was that uh, they would show me how to do it, because I had not worked in porcelain. Um, and so they, but, but um, mice in porcelain and all of these um, factories that follow an 18th century model, everybody does just one thing or part of one thing. So people are painters or they're painters of flowers or, or you know, or they are mold makers or they're like cup mold makers. So it very, 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 very specialized. And the fact that I could make molds, cast, paint, sculpt, that was just so outside of, and that I wanted to do all of those things. So outside of what they could even understand, uh, that we developed a different kind of relationship. So they would just, you know, give me material, and I would, and and they gave me huge support and freedom. I did not have to make anything to be produced. Um, I just could do whatever I wanted and try to mess around with their materials and every once in a while the head of painting would come up and see what I was doing with their 300 year old glazes and take some notes and you know leave and and or if I had a question a technical question you know I, I could ask them but basically they're very very rule bound and very um, uh, traditional on every on every level. So um, it was sort of like a parallel play situation. Where, but they fired the stuff and they were gracious and entertained by me. <laughs> so I, in many ways I was the lo local entertainment. <laughs> Thank you um, so much for showing your work. Um, I have a question about uh, process. One of the things that I'm very intrigued with ceramics is um, about its threat of failure, whether it's in the, the process of making with the air bubbles in the kiln or even in dropping you know, something that could break the fragility. Um, do you ever, and in keeping with sort of like the body, what I see is that sort of body knowledge in your work, do you ever resurrect things that have been broken? Or oh, all the time. Done? And how do you do so? Oh, I mean, just reuse parts. Uh, you mean, technically, how do I do so? How, how would you rectify, like, how do you rectify it? Like, uh, There's no rectifying anything, uh, ever. There's only reinvention. So, so um, I would just, you know, mourn it for five minutes and then put it away and then you know, see in a few months if any part of that look interesting, and then starts, you know, sometimes I've saw, I mean, get out the saws, you know, every, any tool, I have lots of tools and lots of toys, and so, you know, I just feel free to use anything, but there's no going back. Let me say that. Going back is just hell. Like if you try to go backwards, uh, I had an interesting experience uh, with my assistant who had, was here, um, Joshua Clark, and, and he had to remake part of a piece that was going to some show. And he, it was just horrible having to do, I, he just kept, every day was just depressed doing it. And uh, because if you're going backwards and you're trying to recreate something, you're stuck in some, in, in some other time, some other... You're so not a curator. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's just very, very hard, but it is, there is something about breaking something or something failing that I love and that I believe in because it's 
even when you don't want it to happen, as soon as it happens, you know that that is an opportunity. That kind of, you know, ugliness, that kind of destruction creates an opening. So when I was saying call and response before, I was meaning things happen, but you're always looking for little openings. You're always looking for places that you can just sneak in and start something new, start have a new thought, make a new gesture. So I do think that, you know, that, that breaking of things is a blessing. And, and, and an opportunity. I think I've got the microphone now. Hi, hi Arlene. Um, Where right are here. you? Right. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello. Uh, in the mid-80s, I got my master's degree at the University of California in Davis, kind of the epicenter of wow. ceramic sculpture. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, studied with Robert Arneson, who was a descendant of Peter Volkus, and the whole Bay Area. The guys. Uh, yeah, and it's just <laughs> unbelievable to me that it's now 40 years later that we on the East Coast are now having this discussion that I thought was already settled by That's the West I mean. Coast. It's never gonna be settled. Right, and, and so I, I just didn't know if you had anything more to offer there, because I'm still sitting here thinking about this and just being remarkably puzzled by yeah. all of this. Uh-huh. Well, what, are, what exactly are you puzzled by? Well, the, I thought this was already settled. That, that, what was that, cer that ceramics had reached this level of being a fine art material and that it was no longer uh, considered purely a craft Wait material. a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, I, I gave opening remarks at the Ken Price Show at the Nasher Sculpture Center. And I, during that, at that opening, I was surrounded by people who had collect, who owned his work, who had collected his work, you know, buying it from his studio. These very same pieces that are being sold now uh, at Matthew Marks, you know, for a few hundred dollars when he was desperate, he had to go back to teaching. This was never settled. It was not. It was not settled. Uh, there, it, and it, um, I don't think people felt it was settled then. He, on his deathbed, he said he would not, um, do the show at LACMA if it didn't come to New York and, um, wasn't, and if it didn't come to New York and it wasn't in a show that wasn't in a decorative arts department. Okay, so it was not settled. So what's it it was take? not settled three years ago. So what's it, what's it gonna take to settle this? Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's not gonna be, it's, it's not gonna be settled, it's gonna just be boring. Uh, and, and, and it is boring, uh, but it's also interesting because what is it? Does it have to do with women's work? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pawing around trying to figure it out, but I, I think that, that there's a lot of ways that um, the art market, the final arbiter, uh, along with museums, the art market, meaning collectors, trustees, people putting real attention and money on it, uh, and museums exhibiting it, um, that they, that will be a big change, and that that's where things will start to move around uh, a, a little bit. But um, I, I know, like, um, I can't remember, maybe 2012 or 2011, they, they, I was on the cover of Art in America, and I remember during that time people were saying, oh, now it's really different. Well, there are no ceramic collectors, and there are, there is a big, booming 
version of ceramic collectors who have ever bought my work. That's how separate the worlds are. Like there's a craft world, a craft collector world, a ceramic collector world, and then and they have no idea who I am or what's going on, and they're not looking at art in America. Uh, so same with the art world. You know, not looking over there. I I'll, I'll say one more thing. I was at VCU, which in the they they invited me to come. They have a the incredible sculpture department, and upstairs they have a craft studies department, and they put together their money to fund my visit, and I gave a talk, and then I and I gave critiques. Um, a day in, on each floor, but as students, they didn't travel between the floors very easily. Very specifically, the craft people were not allowed to go partake in the sculpture department's cl classes. The sculpture department students could occasionally go to the craft department. So it's, it's bizarre, it's medieval, <laughs> it's sort of entertaining, but it also is boring. We're going to have a few closing remarks. Thank you so much, Arlene, uh, for showing us your fabulous work and talking about it so, so wonderfully. And Catherine, as always, you always interview artists with uh, great insight and if this is just a great evening. Um, you know, this is the kind of event that you can expect from the Elizabeth A. Sattler Center for Feminist Art. And this is the kind of event that we want to continue to bring you. Um, uh, as Elizabeth in, uh, introduced me, I'm Marilyn Reaper. I'm very proud to be uh, the chair of the council of the Sattler Center. I'm very proud to be on the advisory board of the Brooklyn Museum, but tonight I'm most proud of being a friend of Helene Siemens uh, for 27 years. And <laughs> Helene so admired your work on me. Um, she showed it to me way back when, and uh, she would have been absolutely fascinated to see you show it. I, uh, ICA, and um, so this is a really wonderful event because it so mills uh, our respect for Helene's wishes um, with an excitement of an artist that we all really, really admire and are excited to have here. Um, I'd like you to, to take a look at the, the flyer that you got that tells you about Helene. And I'd ask you to please make a donation so that we can continue with these amazing events that we do here at the Sackler Center. Um, I hope that you will do the following after you make that donation. First, how many have seen the show up at the Sackler Gallery? Ah, my gosh. You have, well, the rest of you have to go see the fabulous show that we have there, they're the remarkable photographs of a fabulous artist, South African artist, Zuneli Mahali. She is a brilliant photographer and a, and a very, very famous activist in the LGBT community in South Africa. It's a shocking exhibit, it's a beautiful exhibit, and it's an ennobling exhibit. And I, I guarantee you, you'll never forget it. Um, I know that you'll come back for our next exhibit after that, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. It's called Agit Prop. Uh, Agit meaning agitation, prop meaning propaganda, and it will have such artists as Jenny Holzer, uh, Yoko Ono, Martha Rossler, all working in all different kinds of mediums um, as a call to action to create political and social change. And the opening is December 11th. But after that opening, 
The artists in the exhibit will choose other artists. And that opening will take place February 17th. And then those artists will choose other artists to increase, is that correct? To increase the exhibit. And I hope you will not miss that um, because that's going to be a barely controlled bit of chaos that you won't want to miss. And that will be on April 6th. So you have three choices of openings for that. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring people that you want to impress. So thank you so much for coming. This has been a very special evening, I think, for all of us. And I hope to see you all again soon.